Okay, thank you very much. Good morning to to everybody. Did, um, this is the the talk we have done at the at the workshop with some changes. But the the, the first question is. Are we really ready for the future? Imagine nowadays uh, everyone in the press is is talking about uh, monkeypox virus, and it is really strange um, because it, it, we know it since decades. It happens many other times during the last decades that we have spillover, that we have human cases, but nobody take care of this. And nowadays it seems because there is a case in Rome that uh, monkeypox could be the next step for uh, for zoonosis, for spillover, uh, the next risk for uh, for human health. So, if we look in in the perspective of the future, are we ready to to manage the the, the problem of pathogen that arise from that come from wild animal? I believe that we are not in Bonville. We are not at the Bonville uh, Speedway race, and we cannot go faster as a rock. If we look at what is nowadays the surveillance, the, the monitoring of wildlife pathogen, we are more or less like this one. It seems we are in, in a tunnel. In some case, we can see the light at the end. In some case, no, the, the, the shape of the light depends on on how you are optimistic, uh, so you can see the, the, the light at the end in a different way. But if we want to go ahead, we know that there are several walls we have to, to build in order to control pathogen in wild animal. The first one is scientific knowledge. And I use the, the example of Leismania for this. Because in the, the next decade, since the, the start of uh, 2009, 2010, there was the report of a mysterious case of a mysterious outbreak of leishmaniasis in, uh, in Spain, not far from Madrid, less than 20 kilometers from Madrid. And it is interesting because in the area, colleagues report in, in the half of the 20s, an increase in Leishmania cases in uh, in dogs don't understand well what happens, but at the end they discovered colleagues Ricardo Molina and Alvarez discovered that European hare, or at least in this case Iberic hare and uh, wild rabbits, can be a reservoir of infection. We are used to think as the dogs of the only reservoir of infection. Even we have had before cases of Leishmania, report of Leishmania infection in wild animal, but we are looking moreover at wild carnivore because as the dog is the domestic reservoir, we are looking at wild carnivore as possible reservoir of Leishmania. But since Madrid, we discovered that also Lagomorph can be a problem. And we discovered this all over Europe. Oh, what happens? It started again. Apologize. We discover it again all over Europe. And another case that show us how we are not really well prepared is the case of African shrine fever. In 2010, an ESA report report that wild boar could not be a problem for um, as a reservoir for African shrine fever in Europe because we come from the previous experience of type 1 African shrine fever virus in uh, in Europe and we have the example of what happens in uh, in Africa but nowadays if we look we have African shrine fever more in in countries that are outside the original area that is in in Africa because we have African shrine fever all across Europe, or at least Eastern Europe, but also in Central Europe, in, in Italy. And we are also African shrine fever in Asia, in the Southeast of Asia. And it is really interesting because African shrine fever arrived in Europe in 2007, in, in Georgia, in Poti, here. And it started to, to move 
it spread moreover in domestic animal, but you can see also black dot, uh, gray, blue dot that are wild boar. It seems to spread moreover in domestic animal. It spread in, in Russia, moved in Russia, but at some point will happen one strange things. It start to, to move more thanks to wild boar than to domestic pigs. And in 2014, entered in, in the Baltic country. And as you can see, they become a full dot of blue, a full epidemics of African swine fever virus in wild boar. And this spread also in Poland and from Poland moving to, to Germany, moving to other Eastern European country. And since uh, the start of this year, we have African strain fever also in north of West East Italy here. And in the last 15 days, we have reported also African strain fever in Rome. So it is really an incredible, amazing thing. So in less than 10 years, we have learned that not only wild boar could be a good reservoir of African strain fever virus, but also the virus spread all across Europe. And it is a problem even for other pathogens. It is for this is, for example, a lymph node of wild boar with tuberculosis from M. bovis. We have had other cases in wild animals, such as, for example, uh, the, the, the Brucella melitensis cases in, in alpine ibex. We have had heat since 1996 in Italy. We have had the first report. But we was able to manage and to eradicate the fossae of Brucella militensis in Alpine Ibex in Italy. But what happens? Ten years later, we have an, an autochthonous fossae of brucellosis due to Brucella militensis in Alpine Ibex in French with a lot of problem for the management because there is really uh, people, normal people that are upset from the killing of Alp Alpine Ibex. And when we have to build a home, we, we need bricks, and these bricks are data. The second wall we have to create if we want to defend against the spillover of domestic animal. When we speak about wild animal, it, will, it is usually impossible to have exact data of prevalence and incidence because we have cases but don't have the data of population. And it is why Ined Wild Consortium was created thanks to, to EFSA because we respond to an EFSA call and data from Ined Wild Consortium have been considered by many experts that write about how we can manage African fever, African swine fever in wild boar. They report that the number of our arrested animal and the, the, the methods for estimating wild boar density produced by animal wild are nowadays the reference point. Animal wild started because we respond to a tender from, from EFSA and the tender is about to collect and sharing data on wildlife population because we want to know them for control, the pathogen that are transmitted by wild animal. This is the aim of Inad Wild. We work also on citizen science. We create um, another web page, Mammalnet, and it is done mainly to involve citizen in the study of wild animal, wild mammal distribution and density all across Europe. And it is a great example of applying citizen science to the study of animal. But it is not only to ask people data, but the, the tools is also used to teach people how we can manage wild mam mammals how we we can control the spread of infection from wild animals to to humans and the most important things it is open access all data are on gbif global biodiversity information facility so are easy available for everyone and it is really a 
an approach where we not only ask data from, for example, web apps from mobile uh, apps, but also we analyze the data and come back to the citizen, to the population with the result of our data. This is to show them that we need their data, but we use their data and come back with useful information that can be used also for them for protecting and for controlling wild pathogen in wild animal. One example is iMammalia. It is a free mobile app application. You can report cases of wild animals, wild mammals, living animals, or, but also carcasses. And these tools has been used for the monitoring of African swine fever. And for example, let us to, to find the first positive wild boar in Serbia at the border with Romania. So really a good useful tool. And we know we can, must have scientific knowledge. We must collect data, but we know we have to face to local changes. I am used to think about local because it is a mix of global changes, such as climatic changes, but also of local changes, environmental change, use land changes. Everyone is used to, to say that um, the emerging of zoonosis, the spillover from wild animal to humans is mainly due to deforestation. This is true for, for many parts of the world. If we are speaking about South America or, uh, or Africa or some part of East Asia, it's true. We are deforestating the area, but in Europe, it is the reverse. In the last decade, we are increased the number of land abandoned uh, area. We are increased the area that are nowadays wooded. So we are, uh, Europe is a great example of a rewilding. In many parts, it is not managed directly by humans, but it is the side effect of land abandonment. But we have increased the wooded area, we have increased the number of wild animals and moreover the risk of the sharing of the same area, at least for some part of the year, of wild animals and human because it is really increased the number of people that for laser move to wild environment. And this is an uh, Italian newspaper that said it is the, the, the revenge of animals that come back in urban area. Uh, everybody probably is used because it circulated in, in uh, as a meme in many parts of Europe about the wild boar in Rome. Rome is really plenty of wild boar. Wild boar is asking for food at the, at the parking of a big store. So they are stolen bags full of food by, by people. And this is an example, a meadow full of roe deer near the home. But if you have roe deer, you can have ticks and ticks, a female ticks can sheed more than 1,000 or 2,000 eggs. And this means you can collect hundreds of ticks in a few meters if you walk in the, in the meadows or if you walk in the woods just around, around your home. And if you have ticks, you can also have tick-borne pathogens, such as, for example, Babesia. And this will represent a risk also for human health. In Italy, almost 45% of dogs are positive for ticks. And 30%, more than 30% of the ticks have, have at least one pathogen. And 75% of this pathogen are Babesia. And also in dogs, more than 80% of the Babesia that you can find on ticks are no more Babesia canis or Babesia fogeli that are the ticks of dogs, but are Babesia linked to wild animals. And Babesia venatorum, that is the zoonotic species, is the most represented. More than 75% of Babesia that we can find on ticks are Babesia venatorum and even in ticks collected from, from human beings, 
you can find in 30% of the ticks Babesia venatorum. So one thing that is almost impossible just 20 years ago. So now the ticks, the ticks related, the ticks born pathogen is a really big problem. And this is not only in Europe, but also in United States. They start to, to search for Babesia in 2010. And as you can see, in 2010, they have 900 cases of Babesia. In 2013, they jumped to 1,700. So a really big increase, and it will be all across Europe. One of the problems we will surely face regarding zoonotic pathogen, zoonotic emerging pathogen in Europe will be for sure Babesia venatorum. So we have showed that we can, we need scientific knowledge, we need to collect data, everything is linked to local changes, but what about surveillance? We know our surveillance is not so good. We have Lesmania in wild animal in Spain and in many other countries. But if you look in the official report, for example, it was all. I know that OIE is working on this. They are they are they are working. They start to update the, the data. But if you look, it seems that we have no more cases of Leishmania in wild animal. But if you look to the presence of pathogen, but if you look to scientific papers, you can see there are a lot of reports of Leishmania in wild animal, not just not only in Spain, but all across Europe in the following year. And this means we, we know more than when we can imagine because we have more data, we have more scientific knowledge. So it means the tunnel have more light and would help us to, to leave the tunnels, to exit from the tunnel, but it is not so. In many cases, we just see a small light at the end of the tunnel, and this is because, because we don't apply the knowledge we have in a proper manner. This is from Italy, newspaper, and they say, Walbor, the, the African swine fever cows, because it seems it, not everything going, is going right for the management of this epidemics. So why we don't see the light? Because there is a black hole that attract this light. Don't all of us do to see the light. And this black hole, in my opinion, it is the official doom. And official doom is uh, when uh, there is some uh, government or organization that use rule in an helpful manner. In this, uh, not bureaucracy, but it is the bad use of bureaucracy. And officialdom is really our main problem because, because in science and in life, you need to be resilient. And resilience is the, the, the capacity to, to have a positive view, to make connection, to take decisive action and to accept that changes is part of life and move towards the goal. Resilience is to talk each other. If to share things is to work together for the final aim. Officialdom in, in respect is, mean, is more about homeostasis. Officialdom is more about nurses. It's more about looking at yourself and not looking at the others, not open to the others, but just to close on yourself, on the, on the rules that you write. And it is more or less like playing football, less, like children. You know, in these images, it, it is wonderful because everyone wants to touch the ball. Everyone wants to be the actors. Want, everyone wants to be the protagonist, but it is not like professional play football. Professional play football because they know they have a role and they play their role. So I believe if we want to really do a good surveillance work, we have to start to work as professional to know our role and to play our role. 
everybody probably has a driving license, but not everyone that have the driving license is able to drive the Paris Dakar of a Formula One Grand Prix. So it is not enough to have a driving license. You must to be a master in your role to play this role. And if we look at um, a glass, you, you look at the glass window, we, what we can see is the glass have many imperfection. It is full of dirty, so it is not good, but we don't have to, to look at the glass, we have to look through the glass. We have to look at what is on the other side of the glass to look at the best view, and we have to imagine that parasites are at the top of the food chain. So pathogens are really important. Pathogens are the one that drive evolution. And we have to realize that monitoring wildlife pathogen and vector is directly or indirectly monitoring biodiversity and the effect of global changes. And shortly, if we monitor wildlife pathogen, wildlife vector, we are also preserving the future of our soon. And if we want to be really fitted to nature, we have to learn to don't waste resources. We have to use resources in a better way. And we have to discuss the result of the workshop. And the result are that wildlife disease surveillance is not a program, but a system for collecting data and analyze them. Another result of the workshop in March is that everyone is speaking one elf, but very few are working on a wolf and concept. So what we have to do is to make one elf really one. Don't just focus on animal, on pathogen, on human or on environment. We have to put to merge all them together. And this means there is a need for increasing coordination, both vertical coordination at regional international level, but also horizontal coordination between agriculture, wildlife, animal life, veterinary science and human health. And moreover, we have to increase coordination among agency and between governmental agencies and academia. We need supranational coordination of data collection because African swine fever, wild boar show that inner wild, and so it means EFSA and European Commission is able to collect data at the European level. And also we need to better coordinate and define the role of different players in wildlife population co surveillance. And for sure we need in the future to involve academia in all of this project. Only if we were really able to integrate all these uh, aspects and we are able to integrate the medical sector into wildlife disease surveillance, we will for sure able to fully monitor disease emergencies in humans in the future. Otherwise, we'll be still working on separate compartment that will not talk each together. So at the end, if we want to, to leave the tunnel, if we want to exit from it, we have to develop a more collaborative approach. Thank to everyone and thanks to all the colleagues from the Inner, Inner Wild Project, all these institutions that are academia, uh, governmental agencies all across Europe. Thank you very much.